everybody. Uh, you've got Calcer Associates with um, Tuesday with the team. And uh, we're going to get started in about a minute and a half, two minutes, and everybody uh, get on. We have quite a few people registered for this. I guess um, higher interest rates and uh, capital calls and creating additional PREF classes is a, a semi interesting topic. Being facetious. Uh, we're going to go into quite a few um, uh, topics that we're working on with clients and uh, give you kind of our take on what's going on um, and try to not give legal advice, but direct um, those that are listening how to stay away from significant issues with the SEC and with your own investors with fiduciary duties by making sure that you are completely in compliance compliance with your company agreement and your SEC docs. That is the goal of today's webinar. And at the end, I'm going to end on a, a high note um, and talk about what we're also seeing out there in the market uh, as of the last three or four weeks, um, which is a, a pretty good sign. So we'll give everybody a couple more minutes. I think there's a hockey game on tonight. Right, Greg? There is. Who's playing? Not not the stars though. I know that's why I don't care. But for Aaron and myself, who? It's Vegas and Florida. Vegas and Florida, the two places where it never snows. Um, so, for those of you that uh, have decided to watch the hockey game instead of listen to Greg Merrill and Cindy talk, uh, there will be a, a recording of the presentation that is sent to everybody that registered, as usual. Um, so I think we're going to get started. So I'm Merrill Callister. For those of you that may not know me, um, I founded Callister and Associates, and I've got uh, Cindy Merlis and Greg Ehrlich um, on the uh, Zoom with me. We're going to do this a little different than we have done some of these in the past. Um, it's kind of be it's going to be kind of like a little Q and A type session, or almost like I'm the client and Greg and Cindy are the lawyers and i'm going to come to them as we go through some of these topics and kind of say so i'm in this position what if what should we do how do we perform this and obviously those of you that know me i always give my two cents or three cents anyway but um rather than just lecture on you know what the sec says you can and can't do what your docs say you can and can't do we kind of want to make it a little more practical because a lot of people a lot of people are calling in, asking questions. Um, uh, we're a heck of a lot busier working on amended PPMs and amended uh, SEC docs and company agreements and trying to get people to structure capital calls the proper way than we had anticipated. So it felt like if we can get some information out there before people start doing something that might be going in the wrong direction, save them a lot of time, money, potential lawsuits, and, and a whole bunch of other issues. So tonight, we're going to be talking about essentially navigating through high interest rates, kind of what those might have caused, high property taxes, high insurance, and the effects they have on asset managing multifamily assets. And it, th This could go for any type of uh, cash flowing asset or any type of business for that matter, but um, uh, the vast majority of issues that we have are with uh, uh, bridge loans and in areas where the expenses have gone way up and insurance and taxes have gone up at the same time. So there's some groups out there and um, there's some sponsors actually all over the country that are having cash flow issues. And so this discussion is going to be kind of how to work through those uh, from a legal perspective. Again, we're not providing legal advice per se. I highly recommend you reach out to us or reach out to a corporate SEC law firm and have them go through the documents with you before you even attempt to do a capital call, a personal loan, or take a loan, um, or worse, at a class um, that supersedes uh, the other classes that are existing without talking to a lawyer because you could make things 10 times worse than you may think they are right now. So with that exciting intro, let's go to the next slide, Jeff. I'm going to apologize in advance. I've got a grand dog I'm babysitting that's a puppy, and you may hear a bark. If you hear a bark, I just go on mute. Um, so really what we're talking about, um, these are not new topics to anybody. 
interest rate caps. Um, the reason they're a big issue right now is because uh, a very large majority of the, um, the loans that were uh, procured in 2021, 2022, and even 2023 so far, um, they were two to three year loans with one year extensions. And most um, bought either a one or two year interest cap. Um, and so now we still have interest rates at a, a significantly elevated uh, rate. And I'm, I'm probably saying things that almost everybody on the uh, list, excuse me, listening in knows. But for example, if you bought a 1% interest cap in um, 2021 and you're, and that's 1%, meaning it's locked SOFR at 1% and SOFR is at five and a quarter right now. In order for you to buy that same interest cap uh, this year, depending on the size of the loan, it could be a million to two million dollars or even higher. Um, and so you've got lenders now that are asking to either escrow funds or asking you escrow funds on a monthly basis or asking you to escrow all the funds. Um, so that's an issue that's going on. We have a lot of clients right now. Um, uh, Greg and Cindy have seen this as well, especially in the last several weeks. Uh, getting notices stating that their SOFR is converted to term SOFR, which is confusing a lot of uh, a lot of clients. And so we'll talk about that briefly. Um, capital, cash flow deficiencies, that's obviously going to be the number one topic tonight. Disgruntled investors, um, they go hand in hand with capital, cash flow deficiencies. Um, so, uh, excuse me, I'm going back. Um, and then we're going to talk about... Uh, not so much about rising property taxes and insurance rates. Um, if you're in the Texas and Florida markets and actually the Sun Belt, you've seen insurance rates go up, especially with the last uh, big hurricane that went through Florida. But that does have an effect as your taxes are increasing, as expenses have been increasing based on inflation, and you're subjected to putting additional funds in for a interest cap that really was never budgeted in the first place. Um, and then all of this is primarily because short bridge uh, debt is coming due. So we'll go to the next slide, Jeff. So options for bringing in capital, and I'm going to have my team elaborate on some of this with me, even though we're kind of going out of order. I cannot, or we cannot emphasize enough that if you think that you're going to be in a cash flow position that's negative, or, or, or adverse to, to your lender in the future, three months, six months, nine months, you need to talk to your counsel now. The sooner you can get ahead of it, the sooner you can start talking to the lender, the, the more favorable it will be for you. The lender will be more comfortable. You'll find some of the lenders are actually willing to work with you. Uh, but if you wait till the very last second and tell them, this is what's going on. You've got to do this, this, and this. They're going to have issues and they're going to be less likely to want to work with you. And it's not going to turn out well for you. So that I can't stress enough. If it doesn't have to be us, whoever your corporate, um, and they should have some SEC experience as well, whoever the council is, you've got to talk to them and understand your options and how those options need to be implemented. So typical options that we go through, and um, Greg has uh, worked on quite a few, a few of these, companies many times will opt, instead of doing a capital call because there's such a negative connotation of capital call, um, they'll look to do a loan to the company or have someone make a loan to the company. Greg, are there any issues you see with making loans to uh, a fund? Yes, there, there always can be issues, but the, the biggest that typically comes up uh, involves your loan doc. So like Merrill said, not just with your uh, corporate and securities counsel, but you really need a counsel that, that has reviewed or will look at the loan docs with you because typically the loan docs will prohibit uh, any sort of subordinate debt. They, they almost always will prohibit uh, a secured debt, but even unsecured debt, which depending on your structure, this would often qualify as uh, are a violation of the loan docs and may trigger a default. Are there any workarounds um, to make an unsecured loan, depending on how you're structured, where it looks more like a capital contribution? 
there are if you have multi-tier if you have a multi-tiered structure so a lot of you that had bridge loans that required a delaware entity that was a big headache uh, on the outset actually have a little bit of an advantage in the situation now because technically you can at least make the argument that your syndication entity is not the borrower on the loan and not subject to all the terms of the loan documents so yeah and that that's a, again that's a nuance and that's after we, we're we're working on three of those issues right now, but that's that's based on um, going through all the loan docs and finding kind of little nuggets uh, to try to hang hang a hat on for those. So I know that there are those out there that have been making loans to either the manager or to the company without using law firms. We know that because some of those people come to us and want to try to fix that. Um, Highly, highly, highly recommend that you talk to your lawyer before entertaining a loan. Most of your corporate docs allow for loans to be made. Greg, correct me if I'm not wrong, but most of them don't require um, any type of vote in order to, to have a loan made to the company. Um, but the big issue is you don't want to do something that triggers your, your uh, default under your primary loan. Um, that's going to be much worse for you. Um, yeah, that's totally yeah. correct. And the other thing too is your company agreement will often have a prescribed interest rate on that on a member loan like that. So you have to be very careful that you're not exceeding the loan amount that's that's allowed in the company agreement, or else you're at risk of uh, breaching the company agreement and, and being liable to the investors as well. Yeah, typically there's a provision there. It's like I think in ours it's like prime plus two and a half or something like that. There's a uh, a typical bridge. It's 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 designed to be a market rate loan. Uh, not to take advantage, but the reason um, not only is it an issue with the lender, you know, in theory, you might have an issue with some of your members because that loan is going to jump in front of them and typically get paid off before they get paid in almost all of the documents that uh, we've reviewed. Um, so, Cindy, real quick, um, capital calls. We're, right. we're going to devote a, a, a quite a few minutes on capital calls. It seems to be a very scary, nasty word, and I'm gonna put some perspective on it in a minute, but um, what is the difference between mandatory versus voluntary on the capital calls? Yeah, so um, mandatory would be that all investors have to participate. That's um, less common in documents. Typically it's voluntary, but you do have to make the um, capital call available to all investors. Yeah, and, and so, what, what essentially the effect with a voluntary capital call, is it possible to make a capital call where nobody gets diluted? If everyone participated. Right. And I think, I think what we're seeing um, some of the issues are is some sponsors are making capital calls, whether they're providing the proper notice or not, they're not explaining, number one, why they need the capital call. They're not providing updated financials to show what that capital call projected will do for the entity and two, what the ramifications are if not everybody makes the same pro rata percent investment in the deal. Um, so making a requiring a capital call or not requiring, but doing a voluntary capital call does not automatically dilute the investors. The investors essentially dilute themselves by not contributing. They have that option. It's a relatively minimal dilution, but it's still a dilution if they don't invest or add more money into the deal. What should be done is if a capital call does not meet the needs of the sponsor, then sponsors should be putting something else in that, that, that notice that goes out about capital calls. These are our next options. And the next options, yeah. one, you could look for preferred equity. Um, probably not recommended by any one of us on the phone right now, uh, preferred equity, like a preferred equity group, not a preference, um, class that steps in front of an actual preferred equity group. Typically those are loan to own groups for the most part. And you're already in a position if you're having to make a capital call where there could be a little blood in the water. And so you don't want to give a shark a little blood in the water. So there are some friendly pref equity groups, you're going to have to get lender approval because they're going to want certain rights, certain voting rights. Um, they're going to want control and you got to make sure your PPM allows for that. And 
most likely if you're bringing prep equity, you're gonna have to mend and restate your, your uh, you have to mend and restate your PPM and your company agreement because you're changing the way uh, your investors are gonna get paid. Um, the other thing that we're working on with some of our clients right now is creating a preferred class. Greg, you wanna talk about that real quick? Sure, and, and to be clear, like Meryl said, it's not actually a preferred equity group. It's a additional class of mom and pop passive investors, whether they be from the existing investor base uh, or from outside the existing investor base. But it's a you, you would have to amend and restate the company agreement, which would require investor consent. And, and depending on, on your loan docs, maybe lender consent. But you are essentially incentivizing uh, investors to participate in this I'll call it a capital call or new offering, depending on, on how it's structured, uh, by providing them a pref, uh, providing them pref treatment above the existing investors. So it could be you know, a 10% pref, uh, which is paid before your typical 80-20 split or whatever. So you know, some investors don't love that option because there's a class jumping above them. Right. And it, it, again, um, I think as sponsors and a lot, I saw a lot of the people that have registered, a lot of them are sponsors or GPs or co-GPs. You need to be transparent with your investors. If you're doing a capital call, explain why, you know, what it's for, what's coming up and how that's going to get you guys through the next 12 to 15 months. In that same notice, and, and your lawyer should probably help you with drafting that, but in that same notice, here are the options if the capital call doesn't bring enough money. If it doesn't bring enough money, we're going to have to look at maybe creating a preferred class. And that's going to require us to spend some money on legal because we're going to have to amend and restate um, a PPM at best case scenario. Worst case scenario, we have to create a whole new PPM depending on what, what type of class or whether it was a 506B or 506C. But the investor has to understand that if they don't contribute in the additional either uh, uh, capital call or if it's a, um, uh, a preferred class that's being put ahead of them, if they don't contribute, that's their problem. Um, I, I'm not trying to be callous because I'm an investor in deals as well, but they have the opportunity to help themselves not potentially lose their initial capital. On the flip side, you got investors that are thinking in the back of their minds because they watch the media, they see everything. You know, I don't want to put good money after bad money. So it's a double-edged sword. So typically when you're doing a PREF class, it's really to bring in new capital or any capital that's existing that's an investor that maybe wants to get, we call it a coupon return. Most of these preferred classes that our clients are creating um, are coupon classes. They're going to pay 10% or 15%. It's a preference payment. Don't expect to get 10 or 15% uh, the first two quarters on an entity that's doing a capital call. But what that means is, assuming their projections of performance play out, when there ultimately is a sale or refinance or uh, cash flow, that preference uh, class gets trued up before any of the other classes. Okay, so that's the carrot that they hang out to any new investor or new capital that comes in. Hey, look, thank you for coming in. We tried to raise it through our own investors. They didn't want to add enough or they couldn't add enough additional capital. So we're giving new capital the opportunity to come in and help bail us out. So that's in, in, a, in a nutshell, that's kind of the, the explanation you give to a pref class. I wouldn't say that your investors didn't, didn't uh, want to invest, but you have to let them know that these are the steps that everything is going through. Everybody's going through. Um, there's the option of refinance. I put that in there. The reality is it's very difficult to refinance right now. There are lenders out there that will refinance. The problem is the, the value that's being attributed to these assets right now are far below, at least in our opinion, and many of the brokers we're talking to, the actual value. So if you're trying to refinance out a 75% or even 78% uh, bridge loan with 65% refinancing, you may still have to come to the table with cash. And that's really hard to do when you're thinking about doing a capital call or you're, you're running into some cash needs. It's going to be hard to, to come up with money to do that. The other option is to sell. Um, there are quite a few opportunities out there. I was going to talk about that at the end. 
um, where there's some properties that are on the market. Not everyone is a great deal. Um, some people are selling because they've hit their model. Other people are selling because they don't want to uh, gather a million or two million or whatever the money is for an interest uh, cap and figure, hey, if they have to sell their property for a couple million dollars, it's a wash. Um, and then worst case scenario, again, if you started early enough, on good, good, apologize for that. You're on good terms with, um, with your lender. Um, you can try to restructure or enter a forbearance agreement to try to give you some breathing room. I don't know how, um, how, how well the lenders are going to entertain that, but if you give them heads up and you're being transparent the whole time and you're working with them and they see you're working with them, that might not be an issue. And then worse, absolutely worst case scenario is chapter 11. You guys know I'm a former corporate bankruptcy lawyer. I do not practice bankruptcy anymore. Um, that is always an option if you think the asset is a going concern moving forward with different type of debt. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that on the call, but we have had a few people ask about that. Um, Sadie, I'm going to let you start the next slide. What? Let me see where we are. Jeff, slide three. Slide three. Is that slide three? That's... This is the next slide. Okay, yeah. Um, so yes, so that's secured versus unsecured loans. So um, when making a loan to the company, whether it's secured or not, um, it still may violate the loan documents. So you need to definitely be careful and see what your PPM and company agreement provides for. Um, I think as Greg had mentioned earlier, most loan docs do not allow for a second position. So you would be, whether it's, um, if it's unsecured, it may not be an issue, but you still could be in violation. And then um, also within the company agreement, like we said, it may dictate what interest rate you're allowed to charge on any type of loan. Real quick, gonna, Greg, yeah, can, go ahead. Greg, let me just ask you a question. So should you reach out to the lender if you're thinking about doing an unsecured loan? Uh, you should probably reach out to your counsel first would be what I would say. Sorry, you should reach out to counsel first. If counsel advise you to reach out to the lender, um, you should probably reach out to the lender. I, I, we, we said it in the beginning, we really stress yeah. do not go and make unsecured loans or any type of loan, any type of loan in, um, uh, in a deal without talking to your counsel. Because it most more likely than not violates your loan docs. And there are other ways to bring in capital, but interest rate in terms, don't be stupid. Don't do anything that's outside the ordinary. Go straight to your, your company agreement. It'll require exactly what you should or shouldn't do in your terms uh, of any loan. And you can always take less than the prescribed amount. We do see sponsors that are trying to help the deal and that in the rare cases are able to do sponsor loans. And they, we would see as low as zero as sponsors taking 0% interest. Uh, when they're just really trying to keep the deal afloat. So there's nothing that would prohibit you from taking less. Yeah, absolutely. There, the, the terms in the company agreement are essentially the maximum you can charge. There is no minimum. Um, you'll probably bode much better with your uh, investors, your silent partners, um, if you're not charging the maximum interest rate. Uh, but that's not always a GP that does the loan. Sometimes it's an outside person and you don't have that same... Uh, Leverage, again, if the loan is advisable by counsel. Next slide. So Greg, is this yours? I think it is. So uh, we sort of touched on it a bit already. So um, mandatory versus voluntary capital calls. I would say 99% of our docs, they're voluntary capital calls. So like Merrill said, it's dilution is, is, if you want to call it a punishment for not participating, that's that's the punishment. There are docs, not that we really prepare, um, that will have more punitive measures for failing to participate in a capital call. So it could they could basically reduce your membership interest, not pro rata. Um, they could call you a defaulting member. Uh, which could have a, a, a number of other sort of punishments, if you will. Um, they could 
remove you from the company for it. So it really just depends on, on the way those docs read. But if we prepare the docs, I would say uh, it's almost certainly a voluntary capital call. Um, the docs that we prepare typically make a capital call a manager decision. So it's not something that needs to be voted on because the member isn't obligated to participate. Um, in terms of the company records, I you know we strongly recommend either having us prepare or having your attorney prepare sort of a, a some corporate minutes or something to document internally that you are exercising the right within the company agreement. Um, and usually it would be signed off on by the managers. Uh, and when you send that notice out to the investors, it's like Merrill said, you 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 want to have a plan for that for that money. You don't want to just say we need the money. You want to show them exactly where that money is going to go, how you know how far it's going to take the company, and ultimately what's going to happen if 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 they don't fund. Um, what the, what the worst case scenario is, and, and what sort of options that leaves the the company to try and preserve the capital at that point. So yeah, and one of the things I, I put at the very end of this slide, um, I'm a big proponent of this is, and I, I said it earlier, make sure that you're very transparent and you lay it out essentially in layperson's terms. This is what we're planning on doing. If not, if this doesn't work, here's you know plan B, plan C, lay it out. I might even suggest doing a little 15 minute webinar. Not everybody has to be on it, but do a, hey, we're going to give you guys, we're going to have an opportunity for some to ask some questions. Obviously, you can't do the webinar for two hours because everybody's going to ask the same questions. But this is what we're doing. Sometimes them seeing you as a GP or co-GP on video, they understand it a little bit better. Um, and you've got a recording showing that you gave everybody the opportunity to listen, to ask questions. Um, it is some CYA for... Um, for the sponsors, but I think it's also a, a really good way for investors to understand what's going on rather than just reading a two or three page document. Um, sometimes listening and possibly seeing some charts or graphs and spreadsheets uh, help out. Jeff, let's go to the next slide. So here's where it starts to get fun. Um, didn't raise enough with a uh, capital call. I guess you guys don't like my smiley faces. Nobody's commented on my uh, frowny faces. Um, but uh, this is a, you know, do you want to use a pref equity group? And I hope there are not any pref equity uh, groups out there listening to this. I would not recommend having a pref equity group come in at this stage. There are plenty of opportunities where pref coming in to a deal, if the deal is structured right, makes perfect sense. Um, I'm in some deals with pref equity, but bringing a pref equity group into a deal where either you're in default or you're below your DSCR coverage with the lender, or you're going to be in default if you don't raise enough capital, the pref equity group will smell this. They will know this. You may not get your 13% like typical pref equity groups do. We've seen some deals where pref equity groups are, you know, they normally split it. You have a current pay and then you have a deferred pay. Uh, sometimes you have a current pay, deferred pay, and they want a piece of the GP uh, distribution on top of that. So sometimes you don't have a choice, and that is your only choice to go to a pref equity group. Highly, highly recommend you don't negotiate that without your, your broker, your debt broker, if there is one that's involved, and especially without your, your attorneys, uh, because there will be some bite in those documents. Uh, those documents will be painful. Uh, bringing in pref equity, you're going to have to uh, uh, most likely get a vote from the members. It depends on what your docs say. Typically, it's sorry about the barking. Two thirds or uh, uh, super majority. I think most of the docs are. Is it two thirds, uh, Greg? Most of our docs. Two thirds majority. Um, and why? Because you're actually putting um, a class, whether it's a pref group or a preferred return class that doesn't have any voting rights, but you're putting them ahead of existing investors. So existing investors have to vote on that. The reality is if they don't vote yes, you don't have any options really left to put more capital in. So they're sealing their own fate. Um, and again, I'm trying not to be callous because I'm an investor in deals too. And I understand that, but it's important that, uh, hey, dog. Sorry, I'm grand sitting. I'm, I'm sitting my maybe sitting my granddog doesn't listen. He's a puppy. Um, 
But bottom line is uh, the investors have to understand what they're voting on and they have to understand the ramifications of voting yes or no to approve uh, an amended um, uh, PPM doc that provides for someone else to step in. Again, PREF equity groups are loan to own. Most of you know I used to have a hard money lending business with a, a, a partner and you know hard money lending is loan to own. PREF equity group is the same thing as hard money lending except there's no secure document, but they have rights that allow them to step in. So be very, very careful with PREF equity groups. Again, may work for some, but that would definitely be a last resort. Next slide. All right. I'm going to let Greg and Cindy talk about this one because we've been working on a lot of these lately, more than I ever thought we would have to. Um, so, Cindy, why don't you take a, a kind of step by step? We talked a little bit about this, but go through this um, and I'll jump in with questions. Sure. So, and this is the idea of creating a preferred class, not to be confused with the previous slide of preferred equity. And basically, um, you know, typically order would be you would offer the capital call. That doesn't work. You think about doing this preferred class. And what it typically looks like is um, a coupon class that comes in above your regular um, distributions. And you would want to explain to investors why you're creating this class, what returns they may receive, and how it affects the existing members, meaning that they come in ahead of other distributions. Um, I think something that's very important that we kind of touched on is explaining to investors why you need to do this, what the plan is, and then really what happens if, if you don't do any of this um, to the point that if you don't get more capital in and you need um, for whatever your needs are, that you could end up having to give back the asset. Um, yeah, so basically the current financial conditions of the asset and what's projected in the future. Um, and Greg, you may want to talk about these audited financials because that's something that can come up if you are offering this preferred class to as a 506B offering to any unaccredited investors. Yeah, so one of the questions that we're getting a lot right now is about uh, creating preferred classes like this using inside investors that are already within the company or going outside the company to uh, parties that are not part of this deal currently. And there is a distinction there. Um, a lot of people think that it's just as simple as creating a preferred class and, and that's that. But really what you're doing at that point is you're, you're doing a second offering. So you are selling securities again, you are, you're doing essentially what you did when you acquired the property, you're just doing a second offering. So one of the key things is, and most people here probably don't know this, on a 506B deal where you are selling securities to unaccredited investors, you are technically supposed to require uh, to provide them audited financials, like an audited balance sheet of the company. Now, most people here probably aren't aware of that because when they do a syndication, they use a brand new entity that doesn't have any financials. So the SEC has basically said in circumstances like that, it doesn't make sense to provide anything because there's nothing to provide. But now if you're two years into a deal at that point, uh, the, there's not a newly formed entity anymore. There are financials. So to be in strict compliance with a subsequent offering, like a 506B subsequent offering, you technically are, and you want to bring in uh, unaccredited investors, you technically are supposed to provide or make available audited financial statements. So not, not just your property management financials, because those are not audited by a third party. So there can be a lot of expense and time if you want to go down that route. Um, now, if you're just talking about accredited investors on a 506C, or even if you did a 506B with just accredited investors, those same disclosure requirements do not apply. Yeah, so one of the things that um, that I was saying earlier, if you feel like you're going into this type of situation, cash flow situation, again, you need to start preparing for it now. This process just right here can take months. Okay, you've got to first notify your investors. Typically, you will have wanted to have done a capital call before you bring in a new class, typically. Uh, you can do it at the same time, but then you're going to run into potential issues with existing investors. But you got to do the capital call first. The capital call results either were productive or they were not as productive as need be. 
then you're going to decide, do I want to bring in either a pref equity group or try to create a new uh, class for investors that are going to get preferred over the existing investors? You're going to have to have a vote. You're going to have to provide information that gives everybody enough information to vote yes or no. Uh, because if you don't give them enough information, that can cause you significant litigation later on. Um, and then you got to have somebody either amend and restate the company agreement and the PPM docs and another set of subscription docs. And that's not going to be um, the quickest uh, uh, process either. While a lot of the information is there, you're going to have new financials, you're going to have new projections, um, you're going to have to show forward what the company is looking like going forward. And then in your disclosures, you're going to have to disclose the company already has financial statements, like, like Greg said, and if you're not paying the 45 to 60 grand to get audited financial statements, yes, they can cost that much. Um, you need to provide as much information as you can as to, you know, where the company was, where it is today and where it's going in the future. So, those are significant modifications to um, to your your agreement. So the last thing that you want to happen is to not do those right, raise some capital, piss off your investors, have your investors find uh, you know a personal injury type uh, SEC lawyer who is just chomping at the bit to figure out something that was done wrong, and now you've got suits going against you and you have the sec looking at you and you don't need that so again this is this is kind of insurance this webinar is insurance but you really need to get involved um sooner than later um if at a minimum an hour two hours worth of time whoever your counsel is to discuss here's where we are today i have this this capital uh this um capital bank coming up we've got to buy an interest uh, cap you know in 18 months, but I know the lender's going to start asking us to escrow in 12, uh, 12 months before. And so I have six months and I'm not cash flowing or I'm just barely cash flowing positive. We want to be proactive today. Um, that is the best thing you can do. It's CYA with your investors. It shows your investors you're on top of things um, versus other avenues, which have not gone well for some people recently. Next slide. Examples of preferred returns. We get this question all the time and we are not acting in the capacity of business advisors. Um, now, some of us do, uh, actually all of us are investors and in GPs in some of our own deals as well, but we try not to give business advice. So the best thing I would suggest or we would suggest when trying to figure out what makes sense is ask people what would it take for you to come in and invest money in an entity that needed some cash? You know, it, it's going to depend on the financials of the entity. It's going to depend on who the asset management team is. It's going to depend on what they need the information, what they need the capital for. Um, typically we're seeing, and Greg and said, you guys can, can uh, modify this, but a 10 to 12% coupon return. That's basically a 10 yeah. to 12% preference. Um, with no back end, meaning uh, I'm going to invest 100K uh, to this company, assume it refinances or, or sells in two or three years when the market's a little, uh, little different. And um, if I hadn't gotten paid all of my 10% or 12% annually, I get paid before anybody else, after the lender, but before anybody else. And then I'm out. I don't have any back end share. Now, here's what happens if 10 to 12% coupon doesn't get it done, then you're probably going to look at adding some sort of back end um, share of whatever the proceeds are on a sale or refi. You have to make a very uh, uh, difficult decision to decide, are you going to have some of that come out of the GP side or is that just going to come out of the fund as a whole? Um, and we are working through uh, some intricacies with uh, a couple clients on that right now. Uh, the GP always has the option, not the obligation, but the option to, to forego or to assign a percent of its economic interest. It can't assign its voting rights or, or, or ownership rights, but it can assign some of its economic interest 
uh, provided it's done in compliance with the uh, SEC. Um, obviously, the higher the preference payment and better manager member splits than the existing class, the more likely you're going to raise the capital. Nothing could be worse than you, someone coming in and, want, and offering a 7 or 8% coupon return and creating all these documents and they raise $200,000. Guess what? You're going to have to amend those documents as well if you want to do that over again. And that's a stupid mistake. At this point, if you're in this situation, you don't um, spend a dollar to save a penny um, or trip over dollars to save pennies. So you want to get your biggest bang for the buck and you want to, as everybody's saying, survive to 25 is the, is the term. I think it's more survive to 24, but we can see how that turns out. But you got to get through this and you want to live to do more deals and you want investors in the best position they can be. With obviously the, the, the number one goal is preservation of capital if you're in this situation. Um, again, typically these don't have any back end uh, from proceeds or refinancing, though we do have a, we have two clients that are offering a split and that's probably going to get some pushback with some of the investors when they go to vote on it. Um, we talked about you could offer GP economic interest to the preferred class if you create one. And then obviously all the docs have to get signed. Um, it, it, it's a it's a pretty significant task and that's why we've got a couple clients that are that waited till the very last minute and it's not fun for them um it's much better when you have enough time you can answer plenty of questions for the investors because they will have lots of questions and you want them to understand what is going on why it's going on and what the resolutions are uh next slide jeff Okay, so DEFCON 1, this is what I didn't really want to talk about, but I was going to throw a slide in there. Um, uh, one of my, my uh, buddies who's also an SEC lawyer, um, he used to like to, uh, might even be on this webinar, he used to like to scare people with you're going to jail, you're going to prison if you violate the SEC. Um, so I got a dog in my lap at the moment. Um, but uh, this is kind of one of those slides because at the end of the day, I want everybody to know how serious this is. Uh, you know, DEFCON 1 is kind of the worst you can go. Um, so you couldn't get an unsecured loan, you couldn't get prep equity groups, and you weren't able to raise sufficient amount of capital. What are your options? Well, we talked about it. You could sell or refinance, which is number three. A work out a restructure with a lender or private equity group, uh, preferred equity group. I don't know why people think that you can't try to do a workout with a lender. Yes, most of these are bridge lenders. They are not in the business of taking back tons of properties at once. Okay. And their worst nightmare is to have to take back properties that people hand the keys over to and haven't done anything with. So unless they have a pre pre existing plan to sell that property, they really don't want to take back the property. But if you force them to, if you force their hand and you're not being communicative, you're not showing you're trying to raise capital, you're not showing you're trying to cut expenses, you're not showing, you know, you're giving up something of your own as a GP, you're going to force them to. But it's going to be very difficult for them to actually want to take back the property and foreclose. Um, but that that is an option. And obviously, many of you know that that's already occurred. And it, it those happen anyway. They just make news right now. Um, forbearance agreement, uh, for those of you, uh, that aren't real new to this, um, we did a bunch of those during, uh, initial parts of COVID. Um, again, I know I, I, I beat this like a dead horse, but everybody thinks this is like the worst time ever right now because rates are at five and a quarter percent. The rates really aren't that high. It's the fear that's added to the rates that make interest very, very high, but perspective wise. For a year and a half, we all thought we were gonna we were gonna die. Uh, people didn't know what was gonna happen. COVID is ruling the world. People can't go outside. Everybody thought they were gonna die. And then a year later, everybody had their best uh, uh, returns and best opportunities. Granted, government pumped in two trillion dollars plus uh, to gave more money, but things change very quickly, just like this cycle will change quickly when it turns. It's not ready to turn yet, but it will change. Um, so the longer you can stretch out these loans, i.e. a forbearance agreement, the better for you. And that's, again, if you can't get the loan, prep equity, 
or spatial capital. You can always talk to some of your um, uh, uh, friends who are GPs um, and see if they have ideas, see if they want to come in. Again, if you bring them in and they have an ownership interest, you're going to get lender for that. Uh, so be careful. Um, so work out, restructure, forbearance agreement, refinance or sell. We have several clients going to refis right now um, who didn't actually get 75, 80% uh, bridge debt. Um, we're more than the 65% and are able to refi um, very market specific, sub market specific, they're able to refi. And then finally, um, give back to the lender of file chapter 11. I would never recommend just handing the keys back to a lender and allowing them to foreclose because typically what that does is that wipes out all the equity. Uh, the lender will credit bid it, meaning they will bid the property for the unpaid balance of the loan all the interest payments not paid, uh, default interest and legal fees. And that typically will be a very high number that no one else is gonna wanna bid on. Um, so I would be very um, careful about just giving the, the property back. Uh, so one of the options you can do, and I'm not gonna go into detail on it right now, but you can file chapter 11. I've got uh, several uh, uh, buddies that, uh, still do chapter 11s and you can file a chapter 11 that does not solve anything um, you have to be careful because a chapter 11 means the business it has value moving forward the only way your business can move forward in the chapter 11 is if you find relief on the debt side so you've already used a bridge lender which typically is a lender of last resort now you're going to go and file chapter 11 and the only people that show up at chapter 11 are pretty much bridge lenders or hard money, money lenders um, who get to step ahead of everybody else. So you still could end up wiping out equity in chapter 11. Equity is the last one paid. And if it's determined that you can't continue the operations as a going concern, then it gets converted to a seven. As a former corporate bankruptcy lawyer, I will tell you in most of these single asset cases, I would imagine your professionals are going to make a heck of a lot more money than any investor is going to make in these deals. They're very, very, very professionally, professional fee heavy. So again, I don't recommend, um, I don't recommend even getting to this position, but sometimes you don't have a choice. You're probably better off with respect to your investors. If you follow chapter 11 and just hand the keys back. Uh, because handing the keys back, meaning they're posting foreclosure, the bank comes and calls the foreclosure at the courthouse steps. If you're in Texas or Georgia or Florida, some of the other states that are very quick foreclosures. And if nobody else shows up to bid, it's a credit bid and everything above the debt gets wiped out. So please talk to us if you're getting close to that. And again, we have, um, we have law firms that uh, specialize in that and happy to, to recommend some of them. And I'll just add one thing to that. If you file chapter 11 on 99.9% .9 of these loans, that's going to trigger a bad boy recourse. So that's another thing to think about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> bad boy. And I agree with Greg, bad boy recourse or bad girl recourse, bad person recourse may be already triggered by this point. Uh, depending again, transparency, communicate with your investors, communicate with your lender. Um, uh, show them that you are exercising every possible avenue, which we have several clients doing right now, and you are building your own case for you can't you can't get us on a bad boy uh, bad boy carve out. Um, those are typically intentional acts. You intentionally did something wrong, um, or you were grossly grossly negligent. And so, while they're they're out there, um, there will be lenders that may want to use that. I can't think of off the top of my head until maybe very, very recently, lenders actually going after anybody under a bad boy guarantee, even a property they took back. Um, it's most of the time just to scare you, but the reality is there are, um, these are, these are bridge lenders. These aren't agency lenders. And so they're way more aggressive and have more to lose. Um, let's go to the next slide. Helpful tips. Okay. I might have said communication 15, 20 times already, uh, but I couldn't, uh, my dog didn't like that. I couldn't uh, stress that anymore. Um, you should be having monthly communications as a sponsor 
or co-GPs, you need to have monthly newsletters with your um, investors. And I would include high level financials on your monthly newsletter. Some people do quarterly. I would argue in times of, I don't know if you call these as distress, um, but in times of distress, I would uh, argue that monthly is much better than quarterly. When you're not talking to your investors, they get nervous. They see what's in the media. They see other people's deals either doing bad or doing good, and they hear nothing from you. So you need to have sort of there's like communication going on. Um, I'm going to let you read the next two while I uh, silence my dog, Greg. If doing a if, so, if you're doing a capital call, um, and Meryl sort of touched on this, and you or creating a new class, um, it, it's it's much more effective to communicate where they can see and hear you as opposed to just reading something on a piece of paper, which is, you know, sort of comes across as impersonal. Um, and just in general, on initial offering, subsequent offering, if you don't do it correctly uh, and you get a disgruntled investor, which there are more and more of right now, um, you could be fined by the SEC, you could be barred from, uh, from raising capital again, you will most likely be sued by your investors. If you talk to one attorney, you'll go to jail. Um, depending on what you did, you may. Um, so, yeah. So, so again, this was supposed to be an uplifting webinar and I'm reserving a few minutes because there's several questions that were posted in the chat room. I would suggest everybody just hold on to hear mm -hmm. those. Um, but I, I do want to point out since we typically like to do Tuesdays with the teams and we apologize, it's been three or four months since we've done the last one. Um, with what's going on, what we're seeing with our clients and in the market. So aside from capital calls, I don't want to sound like the media where the sky is falling, doom and gloom, blah, blah, blah. Some really interesting things are going on. There are very unique deals and deal structures happening that never existed before. You have insurance companies that have jumped into the lending uh, realm and they're offering lower rates than you would expect. You have family offices that are jumping in as JV equity partners instead of your typical syndication partners. And they're, um, they're required, well, let's call it waterfall um, provisions are not as stringent as one would think. We're seeing a significant amount of LOIs getting accepted over the last four or five weeks, um, a significant uptick. Now, I wouldn't say that these properties are all distressed and, and Greg and you can chime in. Some of these are just people are selling because either they don't want to pay their interest cap or they've actually exercised their, their business model. And now's the time they have to sell. Otherwise they have to refinance. Um, but uh, there are some unique opportunities. We're seeing owner finance opportunities uh, because some sellers understand the difficulty with going and trying to obtain financing right now and the uncertainty of a, Alina actually being able to help us at the end. Um, highly recommend you don't ever babysit your daughter's uh, dog. She's out of town. Um, Greg, I'm gonna let you finish up and answering some of the questions while I go silence a dog. Jeff, I'm not. I'm only seeing your message in the chat. I'm not seeing it's in the chat box. Uh, Jeff, I'll, Jeff, I'll, I'll send you questions. Are there any upcoming? So the first question is: Are there any upcoming opportunities to buy large, hugely discounted deals from those having issues with variable rates? And I would say absolutely. Um, those two and three year term notes that uh, are coming due this year and in the next year, uh, they those are those are definitely opportunities. Um, investors or, or owners that have rate caps coming up, like Merrill said, that don't want to have to purchase a new one. Um, but we are definitely starting to see some of those we'll call distressed owners um, starting to look to offload their properties. Not a ton yet, but but we're starting to see it happen a little bit. There, there are actually some opportunities out there with uh, some newly built uh, projects as well, where some of the uh, some of the go-to purchasers for these developers have dried up. Um, whether it's uh, large PE funds or REITs, they've dried up. And so there's some opportunities right now to go after some of these deals as well. Um, 
that are at or below uh, new construction costs, and they're essentially you know one, two, three year old properties. Uh, they're all off market, and so I highly recommend that you're talking to whoever your brokers are. Best time to talk to brokers right now because they are very, very hungry, and there is not a lot of business going on. So it's a good time to talk to brokers. Um, so hugely discounted, I don't know. Um, discounted meaning I'm seeing class A's trade in the four and three quarters, close to 5%, where they used to be trading three and three quarters. Um, so those are better opportunities. Now that's still significantly lower than the cost of capital and significantly lower than your debt. So you're, you're, you know, you got to be very careful what you're doing. Um, but there are some, there are some interesting deals uh, that are going on right now. Let's see what the next question is. Next uh, question. Can, oh, go ahead. can the member vote for a capital call go astray, such yeah. as having additional motions made by LPs, such as a motion to rem remove the GP or recapitalization of the GP side with an additional equity partner? You want me to answer that? If you'd like, I can go. Doesn't matter. Yeah, I think we're both of the same. hundred percent, it can go astray. Um, again, if you're not communicating, and this is like a shot off the bow that nobody expected, shot across the bow, absolutely, it can it can go this way. What I typically try to advise LPs when we're not representing a GP on a particular deal, and LPs have reached out to us, you have to be careful what you ask for. Um, you remove a GP. You got to find somebody to replace the GP. And if that's somebody new, whoever replaces that GP is stepping into the shoes of the existing GP. And careful what you ask for. If you think you can operate it better than the GP, that's great, but you're subjected to all the liability that you didn't have before. So just keep in mind, you went from, hey, the worst I could lose is simply my capital, but nobody can sue me. Now people can sue me and I can lose my capital. Um, so yes, can go awry. You're going to have some disgruntled people. Um, you're probably going to get requested for a copy of um, the Exhibit A to the company agreement. And by law, in most jurisdictions, any limited partner is entitled to a copy of the Exhibit A. Now, what you have on the Exhibit A is six one half dozen the other, but typically it's going to have the investor's name. It may have their address. Um, because you'll have investor groups, uh, if you haven't been communicating with them, that have different plans and they want to do something different. Um, so, yes, again, knowing your investor group, I would talk to your largest investors first um, before you do something. If you have large investors, if everybody's you know around 100 or 50K, then do the 15 minute webinar and stay 15 minutes at the end for questions um, and be as transparent as you can. Greg, do you have any, Cindy, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you got it. Yeah. So lawyer answer. Yes, it can go astray. Right. How does the how does filing chapter 11 affect the future lending for the GP? So <laughs> uh, it'd be the same thing as filing a chapter uh, chapter 13 uh, if you were an individual. Does it have an effect? Of course it does. But at this point, it doesn't matter because you're already in default. So once you're in default, you're in default. Um, and you're in uncured default if you've gotten to the point where you're being posted for foreclosure. So you're already on a list of posting for foreclosure. So personally, I'm not seeing a huge difference between filing a chapter 11 uh, and already being in default. I think the plus side is you file chapter 11 and you come out of it. That's going to look way more favorable than you handing the property back to a lender and the reality is if you're good at what you do, but you had to file chapter 11, but you're a good asset manager and ops side is good, you'll co-partner with somebody else who will be able to get the loan. Um, there, there are a lot of ifs in that statement, by the way. Um, but at the point of affecting your, your lending as a future GP, my gut tells me that should be the last thing you're worried about at that point, because you've exercised every other option and your goodwill as a GP is already on the line. So I don't, I don't know if that's going to be an issue. Uh, I, I'd be more concerned about the issue of raising capital than with the lender, because you can always find another co-GP. Um, so let's see. 
Greg, do you see that? Cindy, do you see the next question? So all the partners signed up or Greg, do you see it? Yep. So if, if all the partners signed the PPM and company agreement, what level of risk do we face if, if an investor decides to sue one of us? <laughs> what level of, if all the investors sign it? Well, just because they sign it doesn't necessarily mean that they're on board with it. Um, and again, goes back to what we said earlier. You typically need a, a two thirds majority to, um, to sign the deal uh, to get this moving forward. So yes, uh, an investor can sue. It's, you can't stop somebody from suing you. As a lawyer, I'm telling you, I can sue Greg because I don't like that his hair is darker than mine, okay? Whether I can claim any monetary damages or it have, holds water is another issue. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't, you, can, you, you can't stop the suit. What you wanna do is stop a legitimate suit and don't give someone the ammunition, stop a legitimate suit. If you did everything by the book, you went to your lawyers, you asked, how do we do this? You, cap, you, you cast the vote, you have 66% of the ownership interest or more based on your, your corporate docs say, yes, we want to move forward. We want to change the PPM. There's not a whole lot they can sue you off of. Sue you for negligence? Okay. Um, you have insurance. Uh, but you, you, you can't prevent a suit, but you can prevent a stupid suit from actually moving forward. Let's see. Uh, Lots of people are asking questions at the same time. Um, let's see. Get down to the next one. Um, what should an LP do who is also who is also a KP uncompensated on the deal? Who's also going to deal, be concerned about? Okay, so I think what they're asking guys is if you're a KP on a deal as well as an LP, do you? whether you were commentator or not is irrelevant. Um, do you have any concerns? So the answer to that is maybe, right? It depends on what you did as a KP. Yeah, uh, Greg? And yeah, I, I would say it depends on, on your sponsor, your lead, sort of your lead. What If they act badly, <laughs> quote unquote, bad boy or bad person acts that, that trigger the recourse under the loan it doesn't matter that they're the ones that caused it. you as a guarantor typically would also be liable under the guarantee so your concern is that you're signing on uh, signing a guarantee with a sponsor that you trust and you know is going to act right and i think what merrill was also getting at was if you are starting to make managerial type decisions, it can look like you're the GP or the sponsor or the manager, whatever you want to call it, where at that point you're subject to managerial liability. But if you're just a purely passive KP, your biggest concern is, is the sponsor, the lead sponsor acting right and not going to do something that's going to trigger recourse. So I, I, there, we have a couple deals where um, co-GPs have gotten together and have removed uh, uh, a GP they don't think is in the best interest. And that can be done as well. You have to be very careful how you do it. Be very, very careful. You absolutely have to use some sort of legal counsel to guide you through this. Um, it's sticky. You need lender approval. There's a lot of things that typically have to occur before you do this. I don't want people to lose sight of this is, you guys are running 30 to $100 million businesses with each one of these assets. Um, and you've got uh, 70 to 80% debt on these assets. And these are very sophisticated lenders and hedge funds and bridge funds that have loaned money. And this, these are very, very, very big business decisions. Aside from keeping, you know, we haven't talked about making sure the tenants are taken care of when there's some sort of distress and all that. That's a whole nother, that could be another two hour webinar. Um, but again, you can't communicate enough with your investors, your, your silent uh, partners, and your lender and or PE group if you have them. If things start to go south, have them sit down, see if you can work something out together. See if maybe, hey, look, our goal is to, to refinance or to sell in six months, and we're going to put it up there for sell. See if the lender will bite off on a three-month or six-month interest uh, cap instead of a... 12 or, or, or two years, 
see if maybe your interest cap was at 2%, see if the, if, if the lender will bite off on a 4% interest cap, if you can show that you'll raise enough money to cover the difference. There's lots of different options. The other thing, keep in mind, just because you have to buy another interest cap doesn't mean that money is gone. You can buy that interest cap in theory and two months later sell the property. You may have 10 months left on the interest cap. That has value. That can be someone, some seller, a uh, purchaser could come in and assume that note and that interest cap, and that has value. How much value? It depends on, on, on the price you're asking for, but that has value. I, I see a lot of, I've seen a lot of complaints um, from LPs that are sent to us. Uh, we really don't answer them. We forward them on to the GPs, you know, well, the GPs were, um, uh, they were negligent because they didn't realize they would have to buy another interest uh, interest uh, cap in two years. It's very easy to say that two years later, but keep in mind that typically the groups that are most concerned about their money are the lenders. And if the lenders had thought two years ago that the rates would be at this level, they would have had every one of their borrowers buy three and four year caps instead of two year caps. So. Um, I, I think as it, it, it's very disappointing um, to be an investor and see an asset not doing as well. I think investors should try and same with sponsors to try to kind of play the long game on this. And again, everybody says survive to 25, but get through the next three to six months. Um, I don't want to, I'm not an economist. Uh, my partner, uh, Montero on our, our real estate stuff. He's an economy uh, major and uh, uh, he's got a, uh, an MBA um, in, in economics too, but he's not an economist, but we are watching numbers. Very good report that came out today. I mean, it's not good when he shows that the economy is slowing, but it was a much better number than the last one that came out. So we're seeing things move in the right direction just slowly, but keep in mind as quickly as they raise rates, rates they typically lower just as quickly, but that doesn't mean everything changes quickly. Um, there is a huge lag, especially in our industry on things changing. Um, so I'd like to finish this up because I went over an hour and we weren't supposed to go over an hour, but I can't stress enough for you guys to reach out to either us or whoever your go-to law firm is and talk about the deals you currently have. If it costs you, a couple hours of legal expense to do that. We're not making a ton of money off of it, but you have some tools to then go and decide with your team, what is our next best course of action? And those of you that are still out there looking for deals, now is the time to buy. I did this during the single family uh, uh, ventures with a partner back in 2010, 2011, when nobody else was buying. Now is the time to buy if you can find the capital and find the right debt. There are some smoking deals out there. They're all off market. Talk to your brokers. Off market is exactly what it means. It's just a word. I, I get, we get off market deals that we look at and they're off market to probably 20 people. Um, so there's no true off market, but if you Google it and there's an, uh, an offering memorandum out there, we typically walk away because you got people that'll bid on it that can't even close. Um, and then on the flip side, if you're selling a property right now, be absolutely sure that you are doing the most amount of due diligence possible on your highest and best offers that are being made on your property. Highest is not best. There's a reason why brokers call it highest and best. Don't let someone who doesn't have the same interest in your asset dictate who you should take as highest and best. You meet with your, your, your GPs, you discuss the likelihood and financial wherewithal of the offers being made and then decide right there. There's nothing worse than going four or five months into a deal to find out this group can't close. And that's happening quite a bit right now uh, with clients. So I urge you to try not to be greedy and go with the highest number and go with what's called the best number. Uh, anybody else have any final uh, comments? Greg, Sydney? No, great. No, I think, I'm, I think we're good. All right, everybody. Uh, a copy will be sent to everybody who registered uh, sometime tomorrow. Uh, appreciate 
a lot of you guys uh, missing the uh, whatever hockey game Nevada and who Florida um, uh, hockey game tonight. Uh, go stars and uh, just uh, be patient out there. The, the this will turn around, but just be patient. Thank you for attending, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.